Welcome back to Combat Mission Final Blitzkrieg for another snowball fight. This is the follow on battle to the Heavy Hitters series. Titan and I decided to round things out with a third contest. If you want to laugh, you can read through the thread on the Few Good Men forums where various gauntlets were thrown about as we sorted it all out. I'll leave a link to that in the description. It's all a bit tongue in cheek, but a good fun. What we agreed on was a huge scale meeting engagement on the December morning map with pretty much the same settings as heavy hitters, barred the weather, which is now clear and therefore absolutely intuitive. Titan is playing as the Waffen SS and I'm playing as the Americans. There is going to be some terrain analysis, some force composition, and some planning details in a little while, but we're going to kick off in media res. This is the scene at about 25 minutes in. We're looking out from the ridgeline village just outside of my setup zone. Titan's deployment zone is in the opposite corner. On the one hand, this is a very strong position. I have a reverse slope to play with, so I can pop my tanks up into hold down positions, then pop them back down again into safety. And not only can I cram all these buildings for spotters and observers with a very low chance of them getting noticed, but they offer a series of fantastic defilade and keyhole positions for my armor. On the other hand, there's obviously a lot of dead pixel truppant, abandoned weapons, and burning vehicles on this hillside. Titan is 1400 meters away across the valley. He also has a reverse slope to play with and we've been exchanging fire pretty much from the word go. As you might expect if you know anything about World War II tank design, this kind of long range fire is something that the Germans with thicker armor and higher velocity guns on their tanks can be expected to be better at than the Allies. On only the second turn, one of my Jacksons gets a mangling from one of Titan's Panthers thanks to the open top turret. Even though it's in reverse slope position, an incoming overshoot explodes on the trees behind the Jackson and kills the exposed tank commander. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, the next shot hits the ammo box of the Pintle 50 cal and sprays what's left of the turret crew with shrapnel, injuring absolutely all of them. Titan's got at least a couple of Panthers up on his ridge, but he's also got a King Tiger up there, which quickly destroys another Jackson with a chop to the turret rim. The driver and the radio operator manage to bail from the hull but they're no good without their tank, and nobody's getting out of the turret. So far I haven't even landed a hit on any of Titan's armour. This changes on the next turn at least, when the mangled Jackson catches sight of one of the Panthers as it's relocating. He gets a shot off which hits and penetrates just above the Panther's main gun. A few seconds later the crew bail out. Like my destroyed Jackson, only the whole crew gets out, so it looks like the three guys in the turret are out of action. As events so far have demonstrated though, this kind of frontal engagement is not going to pan out well, despite presenting only small hull down targets to Titan's armour. A better indication of the advantages of this ridgeline position comes a little later when an enemy panther crests a ridge in the forest on the left. A Jackson on the right side of my position, in defilade because it's shielded from Titan's other tanks by one of the buildings, makes the spot and puts a 90mm round straight through the below glacier plate. This time it's the hull crew that don't get out. This is all well and good, that's two panthers out of the fight now, but there's no disguising that Titan is the one inflicting the damage in this long range duel. I've brought up some 76mm AT guns and some 50 caliber machine guns and these are quickly shut down, knocked out and neutralized for the time being by the threat of incoming fire before they can really start contributing to the fight. I have got some mortars that I could be using to smack up Titan's forces across the valley, he's undoubtedly got his own mortars, engines and spotters over there amongst his armor but I've been having some communications problems between them and the observers in the building. Moving a few mortar teams into direct voice range was a good idea right until they found themselves in the middle of an incoming barrage that pretty much shredded them all. The extent to which Titan's on top here is shown when he attempts to push his vehicles forward. He bum rushed a Kubelbarken down on the first turn, then tried a bit later with a 20mm flat wagon. The road runs across the valley from left to right and is completely exposed to my ridgeline for a good 300 meters. I really wasn't expecting him to do anything like this, so there are only a few 50 cows in position to do anything about it. One of these goes to the ground after a near miss from the Jagdpanzer IV kills the gun team leader, and the other MGs don't get their eye in until the flat wagon catches some rough ground with its left hand tracks and slows down a little. Even then the German gun crew only suffer a single casualty and it completes its transit out of sight a little while later. That's bad enough, but Titan's also pushing infantry across the hillside onto the right side of the map, and while I've got a bit of fire onto them with mortars and Shermans firing from Deathblade, 
the range is long and there's no sign that it's been particularly effective. This is distinctly unlike Titan's incoming fire. At the start of the game I tried to push an infantry platoon mounted in half tracks down in front of my hill. One of them bogged down on the hillside and everyone inside was killed and a panther landed a hit. Then a second was rinsed by a near miss from an 18mm shell from the King Tiger before it followed up with a direct hit that wiped out the survivors and then casually destroyed a third. That leaves one half track with a very shocked single infantry squad reaching the safety of the woods at the bottom of my hill. Worse, when they recover their nerve and push forward towards the closest objective, they find that Titan's men are waiting there for them. A probe up the stream results in a quick burst of fire that kills the squad leader and knocks the squad back into a shaken state. An attempt to get some flanking fire in the offending building with the surviving half tracks ends in a hail of 20mm fire. The flag wagon that Titan pushed down the road has taken up position to defend that objective. My squad falls back and takes up a very shaky defensive position just outside that objective in the stream bed beside the bridge. They're airborne infantry, so they have a belt fed 30 caliber machine gun along with a bazooka that they lifted from their half track, but the rest of my infantry is plodding up on foot and it's going to be some time before they can get reinforced. And they're going to need to be reinforced pretty quickly. Going completely against my expectations again and the kinds of risks I'd expect him to consider acceptable, Titan rushes a panther covered with infantry down the valley. He's not doing this off the cuff either. The fact that he's dropped some smoke along its route to conceal it shows some forward planning and this combined with speed and sheer audacity means that I'm having to react from the back foot. I do have a Jackson in position though, pull down and key hold on my ridgeline and it can see the panther coming. Its first shot hits the ground just in front of the panther's left track, the second is also just short and after that the mortar HG and smoke that Titan's putting down near the Jackson combined with the panther reaching the defilade behind the slope of my ridge means he's gotten away with it. The panther still comes in with some 50 cal fire which knock a few of the tank riders off but the tank and most of his passengers are home dry and roll into the objective in the face of my very lonely shell shock squad. My pixel truck can put a bit of fire out but as the enemy fire back they break and make a run for it with the TAC AI making the atrocious decision to flee across the road in front of the panther's machine guns. The troops are so shut up they haven't even noticed that the tank's mowing them down. So where's all my infantry in this? This is a huge battle, I certainly have a larger force than the units up on the ridgeline and a single now shattered airborne platoon in half tracks. My infantry have spent most of their time up until now plodding downhill out of my setup zone through these woods. This has been very time consuming and now that they're fanning out to take up positions in the village at the bottom of the hill, incidentally taking control of the only objective that Titan doesn't already occupy, I have a few elements trying to advance along the riverbank that have started coming in with sniper and MG fire from enemy troops in the river stream bed up the field from them. I'm taking casualties here and there and despite putting some machine gun fire into the offending tree line, Titan's troops have been pretty persistent. This is probably because they know backup is coming. Here and there I've been catching little glimpses of German infantry pushing down the left hand forest from Titan's deployment zone and I've even spotted a panther down there in a way in the woods. So to bring it all together at the 25 minute point, I've gotten a bloody nose up on my ridgeline, I've lost the Jackson, had four AT guns and a few heavy machine guns and mortars knocked out, and to cap it all off, not really interfered with Titan's movements down in the valley. My attempt to seize one objective early is literally disintegrated under enemy tank fire, and he's occupied and reinforced that objective, leaving me with just one while he has three. And to cap it all off, my infantry is only just getting into position. Titan has certainly inflicted heavier casualties than I have, he's advanced further up the map than I have, and he controls more objectives. Sure, I've had some bad luck, but I've been slow off the mark with my infantry, basically threw away an entire airborne infantry platoon, and for some reason I've gotten involved in a long range tank duel against Panthers, Yank Panzers, and a King Tiger that I should have known I was never going to win. It might look like things are starting to circle the drain, heavy hitter style, but I'm just about exactly where I want to be. We'll get into terrain analysis and why I'm actually in an extremely strong position in a second, but first let's have a think about what we've learned in the run-up to this point. There's an argument to be had as to whether Titan has gone all out in attempting to gain some fire superiority over the valley from his ridge, or I've shown him enough juicy targets on my ridgeline to goad him into exposing more units than he's had to, but either way I've been able to start counting tanks. I've seen four panthers and knocked two out. Judging by the fancy hat and the rank insignia of the tank commander of the panther that got killed on the left, one of those is a HQ vehicle. I've also seen a king tiger, two Jagdpanzer fours, a wesp self-propelled gun, and a flak wagon. So I know the Titan has spent a lot of points on armor support. In fact, 
I can go into the force selector and start back building his purchases to get a handle on what I'm up against. I've seen plenty of infantry crossing onto my right flank and while it's not clear how many casualties I've inflicted, I've gotten a good look at a full squad. It looks like two fire teams, one is armed almost entirely with MP40s or MP44s while the other one has rifles and a machine gun. That's not your usual German squad makeup and a bit of looking things up in the editor pins the infantry down as Gebirgsjäger, German mountain troops. So now we can start filling in other elements of Titan's force. His infantry must come from an SS Gebirgsjäger battalion. At least a portion of his armour is a separate unit with its own chain of command. You don't get panzer officers if you attach tanks from the single vehicles tab in the force selector. A good candidate for this armour unit is the support company from a panzer battalion. It's a nice little self-contained unit with a platoon of tanks, which would explain the panthers, and an AA platoon with 20mm flak wagons. I've seen one and given that Titan is smart enough to know that I've taken advantage of cheap US air power in other games and that the weather isn't preventing any planes from coming in like it did in heavy hitters, that seems like a logical choice. I'm not developing an exact picture, but enough of one to get a handle on what I'm up against here. By comparison, what has Titan seen of my force? Obviously it's hard to be sure, he's certainly seen some of my fire support units on my ridgeline, Jackson's, Sherman's, 76mm AT guns, but I've been carefully trying to keep them out of sight as much as possible. Obviously this is because they're not going to last for very long if they get spotted, but also because it makes it harder for the enemy to work out what he's up against. There's also a little outright deception in there. Titan might have spotted that the infantry cooking in the half tracks and cowering down by the bridge are airborne. But the bulk of my force that's been moving down into the valley bottom under cover is actually regular GI infantry. With any luck, Titan might come to the conclusion that the core of my force is made up of US airborne making it more likely to be small, highly trained and expensive when it's actually none of those things. This kind of intelligence processing and deception is relatively minor stuff though. The fact is that while I have managed to knock out a pair of panthers, I've barely managed to scratch the paint on Titan's other armour, especially the King Tiger. Speaking of the King Tiger, not even the Jacksons are capable of penetrating it from the front at this range and all I've managed to hit it with is 76mm AT gun fire and worse, borderline pointless 50 caliber machine guns. Well, not entirely pointless. Just because it doesn't penetrate doesn't mean that it doesn't do damage. The interior of the tank might be fine, but the impact of 76mm AT rounds and swarms of 50 caliber bullets are degrading the external systems of the tank, even though they're just bouncing off. This is a long battle, and this kind of damage can only build up. Cracks in viewport, shattered periscopes, and shock damaged radio components don't go away and as the battle goes on the ability of Titan's armor to spot targets and receive outside information is going to be getting worse. Not to mention the fact that the improved spotting and situational awareness tanks get from the commander and buttons isn't a sensible option when there are machine gun rounds bouncing off the turret roof. There's no denying that Titan's been shooting me up and mortaring my troops up on my ridgeline but at the same time the bulk of my force, the part of my force that I intend to use to win this battle is not on the ridge line. The enemy has a finite amount of ammunition as an entirely non-random example. On map, Gebirgsjäger mortar teams bring a total of 32 mortar bombs to the party and I'm entirely happy with them using his ammunition up in the first third of the battle before I really get stuck in and reveal my hand. This all implies that I have some sort of plan and while I do, it's certainly very different to anything I've put on YouTube before. In short, I'm not aiming at pulling off some kind of masterstroke that's going to instantly turn the game on its head. I'm not looking at some kind of lightning strike or elegant repost that's going to collapse enemy resistance or make Titan's position untenable. The plan is to engage the enemy force in a rolling, extended battle of attrition. I want to engage the edge of it on ground of my own choosing, grind it into the dirt and then keep grinding forward, maintaining contact and maintaining pressure until all those SS pixel tripping down there are incapable of further resistance one way or another. This plan is not a plan that calls for a dramatic Ludendorff offensive or a Battle of France Blitzkrieg. It calls for a crushing, relentless nightmare like Verdun or Passchendaele. Attrition gets bad press, especially when it's compared to its flashier, less costly relative maneuver, but the two really go hand in hand. I'm only going to create the conditions I need for an attritional battle by making sure that mine and Titan's forces engage on the ground of my choosing. That ground has to satisfy two conditions for me. Firstly, my troops need to be able to engage Titans on favourable terms. Secondly, 
I need to be able to give as much support to my infantry as possible, while Titan needs to be able to give his as little as possible. And the best place for this is where my force is getting about now, around Objective K, my home objective. This part of the valley is a kind of bowl with the river in the bottom. Enemy troops approaching from the upper valley are not only restricted in their avenues of approach to these two woods, these two fingers, but once they come into view, my troops will be able to engage from reverse and counter slope positions. In terms of the infantry fight, I'm going to be able to maximize the amount of pixel truppen who can bring their weapons to bear because I can set them up across the river, behind the hedges, on the hillside, in the buildings, in the woods. I can mass firepower in a way that enemy forces appearing over the lip of the bowl simply can't. And thanks to the bulk of the valley side between them and Titan's Ridge, my infantry down here is totally shielded from almost all the enemy fire support. The German tanks, mortars and HMGs squaring off against my ridge line simply can't get line of sight down into the bowl, which means that they can't help out their little pixel trip and camarade in, in the infantry. But at the same time, by exploiting the defilade positions behind the buildings in the ridge line village that I'm in, I can use my tanks to support my infantry and I can direct mortar fire onto concentrations of enemy infantry using the observers in the buildings. So this is the part of the map that ticks the boxes for my meat grinder. I can easily build fire superiority and I can get fire support while the enemy can't. Not only that, but now because he's filled the vacuum between our two forces, there's not much Titan can do about it because he's occupied Objective June, the objective with the bridge. That was admittedly not part of the plan. The platoon in half tracks was supposed to get down there without suffering any heavy losses. That's all gone wrong because I underestimated the skill of Titan's panzer crews and now there are German pixel trepans sat on the objective with a fairly chunky reinforcement movement coming down the right flank of the map to back them up. But now that he sees that objective, I'm willing to bet that Titan's going to fight to the death to hold onto it. Not only does that fit into my plan, but if he wants to secure the flank of that objective, he'll have to do his best to hold onto the end of the finger to its left instead of falling back and escaping the grinder. As for fire support, if Titan wants to back his infantry up down in the bottom of the valley, he's only got two choices. He can move his fire support out and down the valley like he did with the Panther with the tank riders and risk coming under fire from my ridge line with the knowledge that I'm unlikely to be so unlucky or unprepared for that again. Or he can push his tanks down through the left hand woods. This is a lot less than ideal. There's only one gap in the vehicle impassable forest tiles around the edge of the wood where his tanks can come out and that gap is easily covered from my ridge line. More to the point, there isn't much to do for German armor once it gets down to the edge of the bowl. Not only is it exposed to my armor on the high ground, but thanks to a combination of the reverse slope and patches of woodland, my infantry will be able to engage it at close range. Evidence of what might happen to any vehicles that push up comes pretty soon at the bridge when Titan rolls the flak wagon down there forward and gets ambushed by the shattered remnants of the half-track platoon. The exposed crew of the quad 20 mil are so vulnerable to small arms fire that the airborne don't need to use their bazooka to knock it out, but I'm sure Titan's seen that and that he's not going to make the same mistake with something like a panther now that he's encountered resistance by the bridge with potential unseen backup further down the road. The action really collapses into the edge of the grinder at this point, though there are a few important events in the background. Part of the problem with this from the perspective of the video after action report is that the focus of the plan is not at an easily filmable tactical level. This kind of attrition warfare is necessarily slow paced and while killing a few enemy pixel trip and everything will mount up in the long run, that kind of granular detail isn't going to make for very interesting viewing. So I'm going to be focusing on the broad strokes of the three interrelated paths the grinder has to pass up. One of these is the road and the bridge, which we've just seen. The other two are the stream running up to the left-hand woods, and the last one is the riverbank. The riverbank is probably the most important of the three right now, which is why I'm pushing a platoon down there already. As I've pointed out, they're coming under fire from a couple of MG42s and a sniper team in the stream, and every now and again they take a casualty, but that's okay. I've got nine platoons worth of infantry. I can take some casualties now and again, especially if they're attracting Titan's attention. He's certainly moving infantry out of the finger into those woods on the far left, which is excellent news because I'm spotting them with my infantry in the bowl and my observers up on the ridge, which very quickly translates into directing 75mm HE fire from the Shermans onto the enemy. It's very easy to compare the Sherman to something like a panther and scuff at it, but that's missing a point. 
These Shermans are able to shoot up Titan's infantry with total impunity. So long as they stay in defilade, there's nothing that the mighty panzers across the valley can do about it. The Sherman's thinner armour is irrelevant because no enemy army can spot them and they're far out of range of any infantry AT weapons like Panzerschrecks. And this means that they can casually use up their 55 rounds of 75mm HG ammo in their own time. This is again part of my plan for a sustained engagement. German armour equipped with the high velocity 75 or the 88mm gun carry less ammunition, their shells are bigger. Panthers carry about 40 rounds of HG and the King Tiger only carries 35 and therefore they're less suitable for long exchanges of fire like I'm trying to set up here. Pretty soon my Riverside platoon has managed to establish a foothold in the woods on the left side of the bowl and they're running into teams of SS Gebirgsjägers in there. The Gebirgsjägers are very well equipped for close quarters fighting, they have a lot of submachine guns, MP44 proto assault rifles, but they're also outnumbered by the GIs and if I encounter any problems I can simply direct supporting fire from the Shermans and the MG teams around the bowl onto the offending enemy unit and either wipe them out, suppress them so that the infantry can mop up or send them running back up the hill. Once again I'm not going to pretend that I'm not taking casualties here, I am and some of the squads of that platoon are starting to get very nervous. But while I've got more men where they come from I can make a reasonable judgement from analysing Titan's force that he probably doesn't have as much infantry as I do. If he goes one to one with me on infantry casualties, he's going to run out of men a long time before me. In parallel with this push into the left hand woods from the riverbank, some of my forces are pushing up the stream bed towards the finger. This is where the Riverside platoon was taking MG and sniper fire from when they moved up earlier and the American airborne squads I'm squeezing up there quickly start to bump into more German mountain troops. I'm sending the US airborne in first before my regular infantry for two reasons. The first, which I've already touched on, is to try and maintain a degree of deception about what force I've brought along, or at least to keep the waters muddied so it takes a long time for time to realise exactly what it's up against. The second, much grimmer reason is that those airborne are better armed than the bulk of my infantry and as they inevitably lose men, the follow on regulars will be able to strip the weapons and ammo from the casualties and return them to the fight. At the end of the finger, where the stream runs out of the forest, there is not only more German infantry massing, these pixel trippin have obviously walked all the way down through the woods from Titan's deployment zone, but there's a panther tucked away in the finger end. After spotting it and dropping a mortar bomb or two on it, again this is the kind of degrading fire that's never going to penetrate, but it is going to damage external systems and hopefully inflict casualties on any enemy infantry that might be lurking nearby, Titan pulls the panther back right into line of sight of one of the Jacksons up on the hill. This is the Mangle Jackson from the early game, the one with the dead commander and the wounded turret crew, set up in another one of those familiar defilade positions alongside one of the ridgeline buildings where it's safe from the rest of the Titan's armour. It's managed to spot the panther through the trees, remember this is the middle of winter and those trees don't have any leaves, and after firing a couple of shots that are intercepted by tree branches, the Jackson finally scores a hit that punches through the barrel of the panther's 75mm gun and then penetrates the gun mantle behind it. A bit of quick BDA says that although the panther reverses off on the next turn, its main gun is almost certainly out of action and there might well be casualties inside the turret. Although the panther in the finger has been pretty much neutralised, there's still plenty of enemy infantry down there to deal with and the logical problem here is that when my airborne pixel trip and assault up to the end of the stream bed, they're going to find themselves locally outnumbered by a lot of angry Gebirgsjäger with a surplus of short ranged firepower. But that's not going to be an issue because, once again, this is where I've chosen to fight. This is a prepared battlefield. The end of the finger is a convergence of covered routes. I'm okay if the Titan decides to move troops across the open fields on either side, but he's smart enough to know how that's going to pan out. If he wants to move into the left hand woods, into the stream bed, or if he's coming down through the forest, then he's got to be in the end of that finger. And that means he gets a target reference point slapped down in it. This brings me on to the third part of the combined arms tripod that I've brought along. We've covered the infantry and the armour, now we've got to consider artillery. In this case, a lot of 81mm mortars. We've already seen a bit of them, but this is the part where they really start to exert their influence. I've only brought mortars along and they are all on map mortars for three main reasons. Firstly, mortars are much more reactive than heavier artillery. In combination with target reference points and elite forward observers, which are the only units in my force that are not just regular experience, I can call in a mortar barrage in two minutes. That's very fast for World War II combat mission standards. Secondly, on-map mortars bring a degree of flexibility that off-map ones don't. 
If I need to engage in direct fire, that is to move up to the front line or the top of my ridge and get the mortars to aim for themselves, then they can do that. If they run out of ammo, or if things get really desperate, then they make a substantial reserve of armed pixel tripping that I can throw into the grinder. Finally, and the central reason, is that the mortars I've brought have a lot of ammunition. These are all airborne medium mortar teams and being paratroopers who are expected to potentially operate on their own, carry 20 more 81mm bombs than their regular infantry counterparts. That makes a total of 70 bombs per tube with the ammo bearers and because they're pretty cheap, I've brought 12 to the party. That's a total of 840 mortar bombs which gets a big tick in the sustained engagement box. Especially if we compare it to the 32 bombs per team that the Gewerkseger 81 mils have. The only real disadvantage the mortars have is that they're very inaccurate when engaging targets at the far end of the map. This is quite long range for them. But the engagement area I've chosen around the edge of the bowl is well within accurate striking distance. So like I said, enemy infantry massing to receive my forces in the end of the finger there aren't really a problem. In fact, it's exactly what I want because I can smother those woods with mortars and put down most of the resistance to my troops before they even get there. Over at the ridge, things are a bit different. I don't have a target reference point over here because I wasn't expecting to have the fight over this objective. Titan's beaten me to the punch on it and not only injected some reinforcements into it by the panther rush earlier, but by now the infantry is sent around the right flank is starting to arrive and take up positions in the woods to the right of the bridge. I've gotten enough pixel tripping down there now to fend off a couple of probes at the bridge and wipe out a sniper team scarting up the hill to the right, but he's well set up there with a significant infantry presence and gotten the panther into a good supported pull down position where it was going to be difficult to dislodge. The solution to this problem is going to involve getting troops up on top of the hill on the left flank. From here they're going to be in defilade to Titan's fire support up on his ridge, but they're still going to be able to put fire or direct the mortars into the bridge objective and cut it off from any reinforcements Titan sends down to it, but it's going to be some time before my pixel trepid in there are in position. In the meantime, a bit of long range dueling has continued across the valley. At one point, one of my Shermans trying to shoot up enemy infantry pushing the distant right was engaged by one of the German tank destroyers. It actually bounced a shot which hit it on the hull, mostly because of a combination of distance and the way the armor was angled by the Sherman's position on the reverse slope. But with the Sherman's return fire being equally ineffective, the Panzer quickly puts the second round through the turret, killing the commander, wounding the gunner and knocking the main gun out of action. The Sherman is still going, it's got a functioning bow and G for infantry for suppression, I can still potentially use it as bait or an infantry transport in safe areas, but it bogs down and gets immobilized as I try and move it down the hill, so it's effectively out of the picture. But the main spectacle while the infantry fight in the valley is progressing is the arrival of my air support. Strafing runs by P-47s, each one of which has 8 50 caliber machine guns and a total of 3,200 rounds of ammunition for a comical 30 points, start to come in about a third of the way through the game. Titan certainly has some anti-air firing back, but he's already lost one flak feeling down at the bridge, and another which was shot up by my Ridgeline 50s just as it tried to move down the hill out of its deployment area, and the AA fire never manages to hit any of my planes throughout the game. I've had two main reasons for holding off the air until now. Firstly, to give Titan time to deploy from the setup zone. My main target with the planes is Titan's fire support up on his ridgeline, which is uncomfortably close to his deployment area for aircraft which may potentially go after targets outside their set engagement area using their own initiative, this being very likely to happen if the pilots see a deployment zone crammed with vulnerable masses of infantry out in the open, so I've held off so that me and Titan actually have a battle. Secondly. I've held off to give Titan time to deploy from its setup zone. Not only does this let me call in the planes as a kind of distraction while the meat grinder kicks off down in the bowl, but my secondary target set for the P-47s is Titan's infantry moving in the open, and I needed to find out exactly where it was going so I could put the strikes in in the right place. Any juicy soft targets that the planes engage are bonuses though. Their main aim is again that degrading fire to limit the long term effectiveness of Titan's armour. Having several thousand rounds of 50 caliber ammunition sprayed onto the external systems of the tank isn't going to leave its periscopes, weapon sights and radios in a healthy state. And although the Panthers and the King Tiger aren't going to suffer beyond that, Titan does have some softer vehicles up there as well. He's got the Wesp self propelled gun which does not react well to 50 caliber fire and as one of the P-47s demonstrates, the top rear armour of the Jagdpanzer IVs is also highly vulnerable. 
The King Tiger gets strafed a lot as well, and to prove my point about the optics getting degraded, I managed to move an AA half track up to shoot up enemy infantry down in the valley, and the King Tiger doesn't seem to notice it for a few turns. I brought the AA along in the off chance that the Luftwaffe are about. This is a huge battle, it's not impossible that Titan might have decided to throw something completely off the wall into the mix. But they're armed with 30mm cannons and dual 50 caliber MGs that make them very effective anti-infantry weapons. The AA gun does get spotted by the King Tiger eventually, and it's quickly destroyed with the loss of the entire crew, but one or two minutes worth of spotting time is a very long way from the kind of reaction time the King Tiger was showing off at the start of the game. Titan is also moving it around a fair bit. It makes sense to pop the King Tiger up in different places to keep me on my toes, but it also opens up the possibility that things might go wrong and another dose of bad luck might rear its ugly head. At one point the King Tiger exposes its weaker side armour as it transits to a new firing position and I don't have any of the Jacksons standing by to take advantage of such a fleeting opportunity. The second time that the King Tiger makes a mistake, the TAC AI driving it seems to be confused by the wreck of the strafe of Jagdpanzer. I'm ready to take a pot shot. I pop up two of the Jacksons, both of whom immediately engage it. The King Tiger spots the right hand Jackson and takes it out, but by slewing the turret round to engage that one, it exposes the side of its huge turret to the Jackson in the centre. It's a 1400m shot, but the Jackson nails it and then manages to hit it again and make sure it's out of the picture. Again, it's bad luck, but when there's four Jacksons and one King Tiger, the King Tiger can only be unlucky once. By now, the fight around the bridge is really starting to develop. The two main problems I've got are the Panther, which I'm unable to get close enough to attack the bazookas, and which it would be suicide to approach with these Germans, and the German infantry set up in the buildings next to it. The Gebirgsjäger have at least pulled back from the edge of the woods on the right after taking some fire in a mortar barrage, but I'm stuck in a tactical situation where Titan can bring more effective firepower to bear than I can. After trying several times to smoke up the approach and close the distance with enough infantry to overpower the enemy in the confusion at close quarters, all of which go about as well as you might expect, it's time to concentrate on less frontal methods of kicking Titan out of that objective. I've cleared the stream bed to the left of enemy infantry now and gotten troops up into the finger where they're finding a lot of dead Germans killed by the mortars, and I'm beginning to get some fire out into the building from the objective, but events take an unexpected turn when the damaged panther in the finger reappears. Obviously this is still a threat to my infantry, the bow MG and the coaxial machine guns still work, and Titan would be a fool not to back up his own infantry so they must be close by. But it rolls up just next to a team of GIs who managed to knock the engine out. Unfortunately, it's been stopped in pretty much the most awkward place possible with the right rear side clipped inside a tree that repeatedly intercepts shots from the bazooka I move up onto the panther's flank. Even more annoying, it can still defend itself from close range assault with the German close in weapon system, basically a small grenade launcher in the turret that the panther also uses to pop smoke, and my final attempt to knock it out with satchel charges under the cover of a smoke screen goes completely wrong when the GIs fail to find the panther in the smoke and instead run into a team of Kabozioga. Everyone is very surprised, one of the GIs casually nails a German and then sensibly legs it, but it's really a sign that I'm getting diminishing returns to try and knock out an immobilised enemy tank that can't contribute to the fight anymore. It does mark the forward edge of Titan's line in the finger though, it's beyond the range of the TRP at the end so I can't mortar it in the way I'd like to, but the enemy is certainly not in a position to push me and I've inflicted some heavy casualties. It has taken some pressure off my Riverside platoon though, which is now set up on the top of the hill to the left where I can start calling in mortars behind the bridge objective. These are very effective and although Titan's still able to fend off my attempts to push forward without too much trouble, it's clear that he's having problems. After the mortar barrage and when one of my vickers and my surviving AA half-track had gotten set up on the hillside to cut off any enemy reinforcements pushing down the stream to the objective, it's clear that a lot of the mountain troops down there have had enough. I'm seeing fragmentary squads falling back from the cumulative suppressive fire that's ratcheting up, then moving back in on the next turn as Titan turns them around, then running back as the TAC AI for the pixel truck and embraces self-preservation instead of its orders. This opens up the right flank of the objective for my pixel tripping and an opportunity to push up on the panther from the side. 
This doesn't pay off, the panther quickly reorientates to present its frontal armour to my troops in the woods, and a bazooka team near the bridge that manages to get a round off hits the side skirt to no effect. But it's getting enough to convince either Titan or the tank's attack AI that enough is enough and it's in a really bad situation. The panther pulls back to take up position with most of Titan's surviving infantry a few hundred metres back from the objective. Titan hasn't just sat and taken this, he's been moving some infantry teams down the centre of the valley to open new firing angles on my forces attacking the bridge objective, and he's tried to bring another panther down the hill to back them up. There's no way I was going to let another panther down there though, and it's engaged by two of the Jacksons. The panzer bounces one shot off the angle of its turret armour, but the second punches straight through the hull and knocks it out. Second penetration notwithstanding. And it's not as if everything has gone swimmingly on my side. The AA gun working the cut off caused a nasty friendly fire incident when his 30mm HG shells started catching the treetops above my infantry in the finger, making the shells detonate prematurely and spray my pixel truck on this shrapnel. I've also got three Shermans down by the bridge. The one on the road has been contributing to the fight there with HG and smoke, but both the one I sent into the dip to the left of the objective and the one I sent to back up my troops in the right wood and maybe look to get a flanking shot in on the Panther have bogged down and gotten themselves immobilised. Apparently it's pretty muddy beneath the snow down here. But the advantage of playing to a larger scale and working with an attrition based plan is that these details are just buried by sheer numbers and grander movements. It might have taken me a long time and a lot of men to dig Titan out of the bridge objective, but in relative terms it's costing much more, and after a final kick to show that even now I shouldn't get overconfident, in the very last turn Titan shows that he still has one of his Jagdpanzers on the go and knocks out the Sherman I moved into the bridge objective, the game draws to a close. It's a minor victory for the US, 605 points to 419, but the real story is in the casualty figures. The meat grinder has really done its stuff. Titan has lost 230 dead and 141 wounded, leaving him with 148 men on the field. That's a massive 70% casualty rate. I've taken losses too, 188 dead and 98 wounded, but I've still got 428 men alive and kicking, and if there had been more time on the clock, then the grinder could have kept on grinding. In the armour battle, Titan's lost 5 tanks to my 4, and he's lost four armoured vehicles to my five, plus a single very lonely cubal bargain. This might sound more even, but at the end he has a Jagdpanzer IV and two Panthers still running, one of which has not only had its main gun and its engine disabled, but it's stuck in the middle of a wood with enemy infantry in close proximity. A cursory look at the battlefield shows that apart from there being piles of dead Gebirgsjäger pretty much everywhere, Titan survivors are clumped into two main groups, one on the left in the finger, and one on the right up in the stream bed behind the bridge objective. On the one hand this shows an inaccurate picture of Titan's remaining strength because none of those unit markers are anywhere near full strength. On the other it demonstrates just how effective the position I fought from and pushed into is. Not only am I fighting on interior lines against widely separated enemy forces, but my forces can support each other in ways that the enemy can't. Whether it's armour on my village ridgeline firing down into the end of the finger, or machine guns and forward observers looking down from the left hand hill into the bridge objective. I've been in position to fight with support for almost the entire battle, while Titan simply hasn't been able to support his infantry in the same way. This isn't to say that I haven't made mistakes, but these are to be expected and in the end the biggest casualty producing misjudgment I made played into my plans in the end. Rushing that platoon in half tracks at the beginning cost me three quarters of an airborne platoon, an early position down at the bridge and a secure right flank, but it left a vacuum for Titan to occupy that ultimately cost him a lot more. Overall this was a damn good game. For me it was really interesting to fight a completely different battle to anything I fought before, matching up the meat grinder, manpower based attritional approach with the more typically firstest with mostest style of play that's encouraged by combat mission meeting engagements was very different and it paid off. Obviously it's been a huge battle with a massive amount of detail at every stage that hasn't made it into a relatively short video, but I hope you guys all enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next one.